Greetings in Jesus name. Welcome back to our Wednesday night service. We thank the Lord for this grace that he has given us in this season. We thank the Lord for the open doors, for the revelations, for the season, the specific season that we are in. In the last couple of weeks, the Lord has specifically revealed to us that we cannot take this time for granted. I hope you've been taking note of the constant reminders that has been coming our way. right from the vision that our prophetess Catherine saw and then the word that came last sunday and constant messages that we've been receiving from our father on telegram that these two weeks it is special we cannot miss what heaven has in store for us yes it is very possible that there can be certain distractions certain diversions that the enemy can bring our way so we lose the focus of where the lord is taking us but the bible says that a righteous man he may fall seven times but he is still going to rise up he is still going to stand up he is still going to fight the war fight the battle till the very end he is not going to give up the one thing that defines your righteousness is not the fact that you're perfect but that you have a perfect pursuit that you are not going to give up in your pursuit that you're not going to slow down in your pursuit it doesn't matter how many times the enemy knocks you down you have the grace to stand back up and each time that you stand up the harder it becomes for the enemy to push you back down the harder it becomes for the enemy to tempt you to cause you to lose your cool to cause you to sin to cause you to take your eyes off of Jesus each time you stand back up you are standing taller and more firmer and even more steadier that is why we should not be giving in to guilt that is why we cannot submit to the condemning voices that the enemy speaks into our lives i think that one area where i have experienced so much freedom in this season is how our father has been redefining our experience of righteousness it is not just about what we do but who we are if we remember our identity and if we understand who we are then it will become easier for us to be patient for us to remain submitted for us to understand that we are the beloved of the lord and every child of god who is on the stream and is receiving the word of god week after week and who is accustomed who is aware of and who acknowledges their real identity in christ they will not be deceived they will not fall prey to every lie that the enemy brings into our lives yes they will be victorious they will overcome every dart every fiery dart that the enemy throws at them because of the confession of faith that comes out of their mouth because they know who they are and they are not afraid to accept when they have made a mistake they are not afraid to accept when they are being fake and they are not afraid to expose any hypocrisy that still left within them because they are in pursuit of that real you they are not just satisfied with how people view them because their ultimate approval their ultimate satisfaction it comes from how god sees them and how they see themselves so i thank the lord for such anointed teaching and direction and revelation that we been receiving especially i am very thankful for the oil that was released last weekend so so grateful that the little oil that we have it is enough it is enough to supersede every limitation every need that i have in my life and i have to learn to value that little oil that is still left i thank the lord for each and every one of you who've been diligent in standing on the word of god and in exercising these principles that we've been receiving week after week for those of us that are coming here every wednesday night we've been studying from the book of ephesians the first 3 chapters of this book it is giving us a solid foundation for our identity 
and starting at chapter 4 all the way to chapter 6 we receive practical help practical instructions practical applications of our identity in Christ we also learn how to function together as the body of Christ what are the areas where we need to grow in what are the areas where we need to change our attitude our character the way that we do certain relationships the way that we do our marriages our parenting all of it gets touched in the second half of the book of Ephesians today we are starting off with chapter 5 and verse 1 the bible says imitate god therefore in everything that you do because you are his dear children we thank god for this instruction that apostle paul gives us he is telling us that in view of everything you've learned till now in view of understanding who you are in christ in view of understanding what is your real nature now that the old man is done away with you are a new person you have put on a new nature now here is what you need to do you need to imitate god you need to pursue a character transformation within yourself which happens as a revelation of who god is this is so amazing because if you read genesis chapter 1 the bible says we were made in the image and the likeness of god that was god's original plan his original design his original framework for humanity that we be in his likeness that we be made in his image and now apostle paul says you and i we've been called out of the darkness we've been purchased we've been redeemed we have been brought into this beautiful family now you and i we need to go back to our original design and we need to imitate god we need to desire the likeness of god the characteristics of god the creativity of god the mentality of god everything that god is it's not only asking us to change in our lifestyle and our habits even our very nature needs to be godlike where we begin to become creative like god we need to exercise dominion like god we need to have authority over our environments like jesus had authority over the wind and the waves everything that god can do you and i we can do too i'm sure that we all have prayer requests i'm sure that we all have needs that we are taking to god and hoping that god would be the solution to those areas of concern however if we are imitating god then it is also necessary that we become the solution to our own problems that we begin to exercise the creativity that he has given us and we sort out certain problems with the anointing that he has given us with the grace that he has poured into our lives with the understanding and the spiritual intelligence that we have developed because of our close relationship and imitation of god and that it will be said about you that there is absolutely nothing that was impossible for this man or for this woman because he believed in god he walked with god he experienced god face to face and he brought god into his world into his environment because he was a imitator of god i like how apostle paul says you need to be imitators of god because you are his dear children the other translations would say you have to be imitators of god as beloved children of god when we talk about imitating god it may look like a task it may look like something so big and unachievable that we don't even want to try working towards it but we thank god for the keys that the scripture has given us so that we can unlock 
these new dimensions of walking like God on the earth. Apostle Paul says, this is how you will be able to imitate God as the dearly beloved children of God. When you understand your identity as the beloved child of God, not as somebody who has perfected his art of pursuing God, not as somebody who has prayed enough, not as somebody who has worked enough or been righteous enough or pure enough, but as the beloved children of God. Please remember, it's not enough that God sees us as his beloved children because he's never changed his opinion about us. We've always been his beloved children. But that doesn't help us in being imitators of God. We also need to be convinced that we are the beloved children of God. When we read about the testimony that John gives about himself, the disciple John, he says he is the beloved of Jesus. And in those four Gospels that we have read, nowhere do we see Jesus saying that you are my beloved. So who gave John the audacity to call himself the beloved of Jesus? Who gave him the authority to title himself as the beloved of Jesus? Nobody told him. Nobody gave him that authority. It was his conviction. It was his revelation. The way that he saw himself was that he is the beloved of Jesus. And that revelation, that understanding of his identity, that made him a radical lover of Jesus. That transformed him into a deeply passionate person for the presence of Jesus. I think tonight some of us need to convince ourselves that I am the beloved of God. I don't care what the world calls me. I don't care what my work friends call me. I don't care what nickname I got growing up in school and college. I don't care if my parents have devalued my talents, my abilities, my love for the Lord. I don't care if different areas of my life have actually deteriorated because of what I have believed in the past. But today, I'm going to cling to my real identity in Christ. And that is that I am a beloved child of God. Because only the beloved children of God can imitate God, can become imitators of God can now become the express image of God here on the earth. Only the beloved children of God can walk under open heavens. They will walk into a situation which is dead and there will be resurrection. Sick people will automatically be healed when they lay their hands on them. Demons will flee at the sight of a beloved child of God. This is exactly what happened when Jesus walked on the earth. When he came up out of the water, the Bible says that the heavens were opened and there was a voice that came. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And today the Lord is looking for certain people that would believe about themselves that they are the beloved of the Lord. Because this identity that we are clinging to is what qualifies us to now become an imitator of God, to now bring heaven down to earth, to now function in the full image and likeness of God. If your identity is anything except the fact that you are the beloved child of God, you and I, we will never be successful in pleasing God. We will try our best to live holy, we may try our best to please Him with our ministry. We may do every kind of business and serving God and sowing into His kingdom. But till the time we don't embrace our identity as the beloved child of God, we will truly never be satisfied. We will never be able to give ourselves a hundred percent to the Lord. We will never be able 
to imitate God here on the earth. So Apostle Paul, he's inviting you and me to now become imitators of God. Because of what we have learned so far, because of what we've understood so far, he says, now become an imitator of God. This is why you can become an imitator of God. It is because you are his dearly beloved children. Verse 2 of Ephesians chapter 5, he says, Live a life that is filled with love, following the example of Christ, because he loved us and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. What we see here is an explanation that Apostle Paul is giving us to what it means to imitate God, to understand our identity as the beloved children of God. He says, we need to live a life that is filled with love. Walk in the way of love. Walk in the manner of love. Let everything that we do be an overflow of love. Because we have been loved, because we have received the revelation of how much we are loved, it has to automatically cause the overflow of love in everything that we do. The manner of life that we live has to be clothed in love, soaked in love, and a demonstration of the love that we have received from God. This is how we will be able to imitate God. If we are trying to imitate the power of God, the glory of God, but we are unable or unwilling to imitate the love and the compassion that God has, then we have failed in our identity already. If we ask in a public church service, how many of you want to heal people? And how many of you want to cast out demons? And how many of you want to raise people from the dead? I'm sure that a majority of people will immediately want to receive an impartation. But then you ask the same crowd, how many of you want to wash the feet of other people? How many of you want to love prostitutes and tax collectors? How many of you want to be despised and rejected because of the people that you hang out with? And many of those hands that were very excited for the healing and the casting out demons and the resurrection power, you would find that they are doubting whether I want the grace to love. That's where we misunderstand who our God is. He is a God of glory. He is a God of power. He is a God of awesome wonders. But at the same time, He is also a God of love. He is also a God of compassion. Multiple times you will see in scripture that Jesus, he was moved with compassion because of the crowds and then he healed their sick. So the power and the demonstration of glory was a result of a deep compassion that was founded in love. So the Lord is calling us, all the imitators of God, all the beloved children of God, to live a life that is filled with love. Nobody can have a conversation with a child of God and go away without experiencing the love of God. Because we are so filled with love that it has to become natural for us to give love in every interaction, in every occasion, every opportunity that we get. We should be able to give and serve the love of God to others. Apostle Paul goes on to say, we need to follow the example of Christ. Why should we love? Because we are following the example of Jesus. How should we love? Look at the example of Jesus. When should we love? Follow the example of Jesus. Whom should we love? Follow the example of Jesus. And that's exactly why we should keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. The more we look at Him, the more we will become like Him. The more we worship Him, the more we adore Him, the more we are in love with Jesus Himself, 
the more easier it will be for us to follow the example of Jesus. Following the example of Jesus is not like an ideology that you embrace like Mahatma Gandhi did. And many other non-violent reformers, they embraced the teachings of Jesus as an ideology. But the truth of the matter is that you cannot live like Jesus unless you first fall in love with the person of Jesus. Unless you first begin to adore and admire and worship Jesus and have an intimate bond and an intimate relationship with Jesus which is based on faith. That is the only way that the life of Jesus can now flow through you. That you can truly follow the example of Christ. This is not an ideology to be followed, my dear friends. This is a person that we have to love and live like and represent here on the earth. Apostle Paul says you need to live a life that is filled with love. Following the example of Christ, how did he lead us? How did he set an example for us? It says that he loved us and as a result of that love, he offered himself as a sacrifice for us. And that sacrifice became a pleasing aroma to God. And in the New Testament, you and I, we are supposed to be living sacrifices, a pleasing aroma to God. And how will we accomplish that? What is the way to become a living sacrifice? It is by living a life of love. It is by imitating God to the extent that we allow that beloved identity that we have received from God to overflow through our lives. And we would learn to love others with the same ferocious nature that Jesus loved us. And that love will eventually lead us into laying ourselves down, into sacrificing ourselves, our own interests sometimes, our own opinions, our own suggestions, what we want and how we want certain things when we are willing to lay them all down on the altar and live like a living sacrifice. That is the life that becomes a pleasing aroma to God. Jesus' death on the cross was a pleasing aroma to the Father. When you and I, when we live lives that are surrendered, lives that are self-sacrificial, lives that are filled and soaked in love and a demonstration of the example of Christ, then our life, it becomes a pleasing aroma to God. Our lives become that living sacrifice. I'm sure that the Lord will give you opportunities in some of your relationships, some of your close friendships. It could be in your church relationships or your work relationships where you may have to sacrifice certain interests of yours just to demonstrate love, just to demonstrate grace, just to demonstrate mercy. Please understand that I am not asking you to compromise with your values, with your principles. The Lord will never expect you to begin to sin and live in a life of sin just to demonstrate love. Jesus never did that. That is not the way of Jesus. But we can definitely keep aside our personal preferences in order to explain and manifest the love of Christ to other people. Most times it is our own inhibitions and our own preconceived notions and our own traditions that stop us from loving others. The same was true about the Pharisees and the religious scholars and the leaders during the time of Jesus. They would do a great job at teaching scripture and yet they would never even lift a finger to lighten the burden of somebody that is struggling under the weight of that scripture. They would do everything possible to tell people do not commit adultery and they would even stone them when they would commit adultery. But they would never inspect themselves to see if there are sins lurking within that disqualifies them to judge 
other people. This is the manner of love. This is the manner of grace. This is the life and the example that Jesus set for us. That is why Apostle Paul says you need to live a life that is filled with love, following the example of Christ. Because Christ, he loved us and he gave himself up as a sacrifice for us, resulting in a pleasing aroma to the Lord, to his Father. I hope and I pray that this week, every action of ours, every reaction of ours will be a pleasing aroma to the Lord because it is in the manner of love, because it is a demonstration of following the example of Christ. Let's move on to read Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3. Apostle Paul says, Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Now, Apostle Paul is explaining to us what does it mean to live a life of love. In the first verse, he tells us that we need to be imitators of God and that will happen only if we are beloved children of God. In verse 2, he tells us to now live a life that is a demonstration of love and the manner of Jesus. And in verse 3, he says, because of that love, let there be no sexual immorality, no impurity, no greed that is found among you. Every kind of sin that we commit here on the earth, it is in direct disobedience or violation to two laws that Jesus gave us. He said, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Second, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. So every sin that we commit, it is directly violating these two commandments that Jesus gave us. So anybody that is living a life of love cannot continue in sexual immorality. He cannot continue in impurity and he will not continue to live a life of greed. It is impossible for us to love Jesus deeply, to love the neighbors that God has given us ferociously and then continue to live a life of sin. There is definitely something that is missing there. There is definitely something that we don't understand about how to love God and how to love our neighbors. Because if we love our neighbors, then how can we sin with them sexually? How can we hurt them? How can we demonstrate the love of Jesus in such a defiling manner? So the solution for any kind of immorality or any kind of impurity and any kind of greed is to get restored in our love for the Lord and get restored in our love for God's people. When our heart is restored, when the condition of our heart is stabilized, when our heart understands what it means to truly live a life of love, then walking away from sexual immorality becomes so easy. Walking away from impurity becomes so easy. Walking away from greed, a lifestyle of greed and covetousness, it becomes so easy. And the Bible says, such sins may not even be named among you. And the reason is because we are known as God's people, as saints of God. How can it be that we continue to carry such sins and we continue to condone such sins and we continue to tolerate such sins? Don't we know that we are the people of God, which means we are the ambassadors of God, which means we are called by the name of God? Anything that we say yes to, anything that we publicly acknowledge as it is okay, anything that we condone, it is like putting a seal of approval from God. It is again coming back to our identity, telling us who we are. We are God's people. We are His holy representatives. We are His ambassadors. We are 
called to be saints here on the earth and that is why it is unbecoming of us the word used there is as is improper that is not proper among the saints may we have the grace and the revelation to understand what is proper among the saints the discernment to accept the proper things and the discernment to reject what is improper what is not supposed to be named among us for example when the scripture says there can be no impurity among you the things that were impure back then we have learned to accept it as purity now we have learned to accept it as culturally relevant and culturally okay to do certain things and it is necessary for us to grow in discernment to understand what are the things that are proper and what are the things that are improper among the people of god we cannot just succumb to our culture and call everything that they call pure as pure we need to define what is impurity among the people of god we need to know what is improper what is sexual immorality and what can be called as greed we need to define the boundaries and we need to put those guard rails around ourselves in order to pursue a lifestyle that is proper among the saints that is proper in the eyes of god that is proper in the manner of god that is proper in its demonstration of love for god and love for the people around them let me get back to this if we can fix our identity if we can embrace our identity and if we can have a revelation of how beloved we are how much we are the loved ones of god it will automatically bring a deep drive and desire inside of us to now imitate god and to represent god here on the earth and such a pursuit to imitate god will cause us to want to live a life that is driven with love driven by love and such a life is self sacrificial such a life is uh, in pursuit of the example of jesus christ such a life it becomes a pleasing aroma to god because of its sacrificial nature and it is to such a life that god is looking at and saying let me help you take away every kind of immorality every kind of impurity every kind of covetousness all the greed that you have let me help you get rid of all of them because these things cannot have any place among you it cannot even be named among you so let me help you The Bible says that there is grace available for those who humble themselves. But if we are proud, if we are arrogant, if we are stubborn in our ways, then the Lord will oppose us. But if we humble ourselves and if we accept that there are areas, there are certain snakes, certain vipers that need to be treated with fire, then the Lord will help us. He will help us disconnect from those things from those behaviors from those addictions or it could just be a general thinking thought pattern a mental struggle that you are going through the lord will help us he will give us the grace to overcome and we are together dreaming of building a church that apostle paul spoke about where sins like this will not even be named among you it will not even be remotely close to any of you i'm sure that it is possible for us to attain such level such a standard in the church in the body of christ if it is written in scripture then we have the grace not only to teach it but also to practice it not only to practice it but now to make it a culture in our churches and in our communities and in our homes and i believe that it is possible that these sins will not even be found among us in the mighty name of jesus so i'm reading verse 3 one more time let there be no sexual immorality impurity or greed among you such sins 
have no place among God's people. Apostle Paul continues the list in verse 4. Let's read it. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Now he is talking about the power of our words, the way that we express certain things with our mouth. The previous scripture, it was more about a heart condition. Now it is talking about how we express our heart. Because we know and understand that out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. So here is a great way for us to understand when our heart is swaying away. It is that the words of our mouth will become obscene. It would sometimes become foolish. It would become coarse. And all of a sudden, there is no more thankfulness towards God. And that's when we realize that there are issues in our heart that needs to be fixed. There could be some doors that we have left open, some areas that we have left unguarded, where impurity has entered into my heart, or immorality has entered into my heart, or greed has entered into my heart, and it is now beginning to manifest itself in the stories that I speak, in the filthiness that comes out of my mouth in the foolishness that I release with my words. We studied this a little bit last time when we were talking about the foul and the abusive languages that come out of our mouth. And God was teaching us to replace it with speaking only things that are edifying, things that are good, things that are helpful, things that encourage and things that bring life to those who hear them. And in this portion of scripture in chapter 5 and verse 4, Apostle Paul is explaining to us that there are times when we leave our hearts unguarded, it can automatically lead us into obscenity. It can lead us into filth. It can lead us into crude joking. Some of the comedians that we follow online and some of the sitcoms that we watch or some of the Instagram reels that we follow if we are not careful with what goes inside of us, then it is just a matter of time before those obscene things begin to flow from our mouth as well. I know that we live in a world where we love to be entertained. We love to laugh. We love to enjoy some pleasure. And sometimes this can be at the cost of putting someone else down. It can actually be derogatory of a particular person or a particular community or other times, it can just be pure, plain, vulgar content. The Bible says, these are not for you. These are out of place in a child of God's life. And in this environment, these things are not welcome. So tonight, I want us to go back to our identity and disconnect from every obscenity, every foolish talk, every coarse and crude jokes that we have given our ears to, that we have given our tongue to. And we have to repent of it tonight. And we have to say, Lord, no more of it because of who I am, because of where I belong, because of who I represent. My voice, my language, it is supposed to be a spokesperson for God, for the glory of Jesus for the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is why I cannot use it for obscenity, for foolish talk and for coarse joking. Like I explained at the start, Apostle Paul is giving us very practical help and solutions to certain things that we take for granted. On a regular day, we wouldn't think that conversations that are just foolish in nature or coarse joking or just obscene conversations are something we should avoid. But here is Apostle Paul telling us why we should avoid these things and how these are out of character for a child of God. The KJV Bible says it is inconvenient for a child of God. 
because it is just adding too many complications into your life into your journey into your pursuit of your destiny it is just adding inconvenience and that is why we have to avoid them and instead of obscene stories instead of foolish talk and instead of coarse jokes you need to have thankfulness your conversations your speech it needs to be covered in thankfulness in thanksgiving when you speak to others there has to be a constant demonstration of how thankful you are to god for the things that you have how thankful you are for the life that you live how thankful you are for the relationships that you have that has to become the mark of a believer the moment we stop being thankful the moment we start complaining we are back to saying and speaking foolish talks and then we are thinking why is nothing changing in my life why is there no blessings and why is there no promotions it's because of the foolish talks that we have engaged our tongues in and those foolish talks it has the power to kill life it has the power to kill opportunities it has the power to kill the favor of god upon your life and that is why the lord is calling us to a lifestyle of thankfulness see our thankfulness if it is just within us inside our hearts but it is not expressed in the words that we speak if it is not expressed in our lifestyles if it is not expressed in the way that we put our offerings if it is not expressed in the way that we constantly keep building altars for the things that we are thankful for then i don't think that that thankfulness is genuine or it is really deep rooted a gratitude to god a thankfulness to god it needs to have an expression it needs to have a outlet and this evening you have an option you have a place you have a church you have a community where you can express your thankfulness the testimonies that we speak on social media it is an expression of your thankfulness to the lord can it be full of what god has done for you can it be full of what your church has blessed you with can it be full of how your man of god is becoming a blessing to you some of us are so occupied talking about what we are doing for god than speaking about what god is doing for us our feeds and our stories are usually so much about ourselves and what we have done in life and how we enjoyed this or we enjoyed that rather than bringing thanks and a grateful heart unto the lord the solution to obscene talk to foolish conversations to coarse joking is not to just keep your mouth shut it is not to just say hey don't speak anything from here on the solution to obscene talks obscene stories or foolish talk or coarse jokes is a lifestyle of speaking thankfulness to the lord may we have the grace to articulate our thankfulness articulate our gratefulness articulate our honor in this season we have to learn to speak and demonstrate our thankfulness to the lord our thankfulness to our churches our thankfulness to the men and the women of god that the lord has given us one of the things that can stand as a hindrance or an obstacle to your thankfulness is a lifestyle of speaking and talking things that are completely anti your identity your identity is that you are a beloved child of god but when you constantly speak stories or talks or jokes that are not glorifying god that are not benefiting your destiny that is not helping your relationship with god or building your relationship with others then it is absolutely going to stand in the way of your thankfulness it is going to stand in the way of your worship it is going to stand in the way of your relationship with god that is why apostle james said can the same spring bring forth salt water and fresh water 
So can it be possible that the same mouth can speak curses and blessings, worship unto the Lord, and at the same time, constant filth coming out of the same tongue? It cannot be. Tonight, we are changing that because of our identity in Christ, because of who we are, we are putting a full stop to certain things. Apostle Paul says, Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to the Lord. Let's read verse 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. It says, You can be sure this is something that is certain. You can take it in writing. This is a guarantee. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. Apostle Paul, he is making sure that we get his point of how serious this issue is. He is explaining to us that we have to be certain this is something that we cannot doubt. He is emphasizing the fact that if we live immoral lives and there is absolutely no repentance, there is no fruit of your repentance, there is no turning back to God, and you continue to live in this lifestyle till this lifestyle now becomes your identity, then you will not inherit the kingdom of Christ. You will not enter into the kingdom of God. He says the same thing about an impure person. Now he's not just talking about a characteristic. He's talking about the identity. In verse 3, when Paul was explaining, let there be no sexual immorality or impurity or greed that is named among you. He's not talking about a person. He's talking about a characteristic that can be reflected in certain individuals. But in verse 5, he's talking about people that have been overtaken by these characteristics to the extent that it has now become their identity. He says, a person, an immoral person, an impure person, or a greedy person, which means these people, they have given themselves to this sin to the extent that their identity is no longer that they are the beloved children of God. Their identity is no longer that they are servants of Christ. Their identity has been overtaken by their behaviors, by their actions, by their lifestyle. Any sin that is left unguarded, that is left without repentance, that sin has the capacity to take over your life. Apostle James, he said this in James chapter 1. He said, when a desire is conceived, that is the best time to kill it. But if you don't kill that desire, that desire will give birth to a sin. But the sin, when you leave it unattended and you're constantly feeding the sin and you're constantly allowing the sin to grow, this sin can grow to a full maturity and the sin can give way to death. And that's exactly what is happening here in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 5. These people who did not repent, who did not change their ways, who did not mend their lifestyle, they eventually lost their inheritance in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Christ. It is not talking about somebody who is not a believer. Because an unbeliever, he is alien to the promises of God. He has no inheritance in the first place. But a person who believed in Jesus, who received the inheritance, who were given promises of God, who were given access into the things of God, into the heart of God, into the mind of God, when they continue to live in immorality and impurity and greed to the extent that those characteristics now take over their identity. The Bible says they will lose their inheritance. 
that they will no longer inherit the kingdom of God. They will no longer enter into the kingdom of Christ. And that is a very serious warning for some of us tonight. I pray that we will take this warning seriously and that we will not continue to play with fire, that we will not continue to play with these uh, characteristics that we have to deal with to the extent that it takes over our identity. The Bible says, for a greedy person, he is an idolater. He is worshipping the things of this world. It is actually giving us a justification for God's denial of giving inheritance to these guys. He says, the person who is a greedy person, for example, there are three categories of people mentioned here, greedy, impure and immoral. So he is just picking up one example and he says that the greedy person, he is an idol worshipper because he is worshipping the things of this world. Because of his constant desire for more things, more money, more houses, more vehicles, more conveniences. And in this pursuit of more, they lose their identity and they lose their eyes that should be focused on God. And eventually, they begin to admire their possessions more than they admire God. And then the Bible says they are now worshipping the things of the world. So it is possible for somebody who is a Christian, a child of God, who believes that he is a follower of Christ, to also parallelly worship the things of this world, to worship people that can lead to lust, that can worship certain ideologies that can lead to impurity, who could worship certain possessions which can lead to greed. And that's why I said, the only solution to fix a problem in our heart is to restore our worship. If we can go back to loving Jesus, if we can go back to falling afresh in love with Jesus, coming back to our first love, keeping our gaze and our attention and our adoration completely and only on Jesus, if we can come back to our roots, then our characteristics can be fixed easily. The fruits of our life can be fixed easily. The uh, relationship issues that we face, it can be fixed easily. The problems that you have with your conversations, your tongue, the foolish things that you speak, the coarse joking, the obscene stories, all of that can be fixed very easily. We just need to fix your worship first. We just need to fix whom you love. We need to fix your heart's desire towards God. We need to just change what your eye is constantly gazing at and automatically the whole course of your life will change. Whatever you worship will become your identity. Let me read from Psalm 135 verse 15 to 18. The idols of the nations are merely things of silver and gold. They are shaped by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak. They have eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. And they have mouths but cannot breathe. And those who make idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. It talks about two groups of people. One are the guys who make these idols and second are the guys who trust in these idols. It says their identity gets transformed to the ones that they adore. They become like their idols. They become speechless. They become sightless. They become breathless and they become lifeless. Today, I am sure that most of us who are Christians, believers in the Lord Jesus, if we see an idol, we will not really be tempted to go and bow down before that idol. But this may become our temptation, that our greed can cause us to worship the things of the world. Our lust may cause us to trust in people that we should be running away from. And certain 
wrong attitudes or wrong philosophies may be bringing impurities into your life and those impurities might be becoming your own personal idol your own idol made of gold and silver that you are bowing down before either ways if we do not turn our backs to these things and we repent from these things and we get back with god get back to our right relationship with god these things can become our identity those who make these idols and those who trust in them can become like these idols i thank the lord that this is not our story i thank the lord that we have our own identity in christ i thank the lord that we are called the beloved of the lord and because we are the beloved of the lord we have access into the ways of god into the mannerisms of god now we can imitate god now we can represent god here on the earth and because we are imitating god we will have a life that is full of love because god is love anybody that has a relationship with god will automatically overflow in love and that love it is going to represent the life of jesus the same way that jesus lived his life here on the earth the same way that he sacrificed himself laid himself down for our sake and the way that he became a fragrant aroma unto the lord you and i who are the imitators of god who are filled with the love of god we will also lay down our lives following the example of christ we will also become a pleasing aroma to our god we also read certain warnings that apostle paul gave let these sins not even be named among you sexual immorality impurity and greed or covetousness let these have no place among the people of god we are the people of god we are the saints of god we are the children of god so there are certain things that we are considering it as improper among us we reject them we say a goodbye to them we depend on the presence and the power that the holy spirit gives us to overcome every temptation that the enemy is throwing at us and we will also deal with any type of obscene stories any foolish talks any crude joking that we have given ourselves into we are also avoiding every kind of ungratefulness every murmur every anger we want to replace it with words of thankfulness we want to speak and articulate our words of honor and gratitude unto the lord unto the house of worship unto the people of god unto the man and the woman of god that god has given us and we also want to be sure to cling on to our inheritance our inheritance in the kingdom of god in the kingdom of christ we will not lose it because we will not allow our weaknesses to become our identity we will repent of our weaknesses and we will cling to our identity as the beloved of jesus let's pray father we thank you for tonight We thank you because your word is alive and your word is active. We thank you because you use your word to sharpen us, to focus us, to cause us to return back to our first love. And tonight we want to fix our eyes back on you. Because every time we take our eyes off of you, we end up worshiping other idols. But tonight we want to keep our eyes back on Jesus. back on your face we want to behold you to gaze at your beauty all the days of our lives all through our highs and even through our lows we want to keep looking at you jesus because the more we gaze at you the more we trust in you the more we become like you who we worship will become our identity lord we want to be imitators of god we want to be imitators of your nature your power your love your compassion your grace your glory we want to imitate you every step of the way 
So we thank you for this beloved identity that we have received from you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.